Hello everyone and welcome to episode 274 of Korea Podcast. Our today's guest is Mr. Stein Windig. He's a concept artist from Castricum, Netherlands. And in the captions, you can find the link to his personal website and also his art station as well, which actually that's a place where you can find his email as well if you had any connections or or basically you need, not connections, questions. Jesus, my brain is not really working right now. <laughs> if you had any questions, you can just contact him through there and, you know, with that cooking introduction out of the way, uh, I hope everyone is having a good day. And speaking of having a good day, thanks so much for coming on for this podcast. How are you doing today? Thanks, Ronton. Um, doing well. Just uh, the end of a work day. Happy to be here. Awesome. And uh, well, I mean, I went through like a catalog of your works on our session and uh, we got, you know, some quite interesting things we can actually talk about. Um, but for starters, before we get into that conversation, um, let's, you know, start off with the first question of the podcast, which is give us a little introduction on how we got into the world of visual arts and design. Like basically, um, tell us your origin story if you know how, what led you to choose art as a path in your life. Lack of any other applicable skills. No, um, it's, it's very much the same as um, many other artists. Like I was the kid that didn't stop drawing. I was always drawing and I had a, a lot of encouragement from my family as well. My uncle is a comic artist in, uh, in the Netherlands and my dad was actually teaching art in high school. So I was already uh, kind of in that world. Um, also, probably during high school, I started playing D and D and reading a lot of fantasy books. I was very, I always read a lot, and I, I just was trying to imagine what that world would look like and trying to draw that. And it was pretty natural to to go to an art school after that. Um, but this was in the nineties because I'm from nineteen seventy four, so. Um, this is pre-digital, so it wasn't like concept art didn't really exist yet. There was I basically wanted to be a fantasy artist like uh, Larry Elmore or um, Michael Whelan, like the, the people that illustrated those Dungeons and Dragons books. Um, that was kind of my my goal. Uh, then I went to I first studied fine arts in the Hague, was painting and drawing. Then. While I was, I was pretty much done with that, but then I went to the um, animation festival in Annecy in France uh, because a friend of mine was studying animation and my mind was very much blown by all the, all the different techniques and weird animations I saw there. And also there was a, an animation test from Toy Story. So it wasn't a trailer, it was just, uh, just a, a test but I was completely mind blown by 3D. This was the first time I saw 3D. Uh, and then I studied for three more years uh, studying animation. And then I, I've been an animator for, for like 10, 15 years, like a 3D generalist, but I, we did everything because this is like, uh, there's a very small industry in the Netherlands. So it's not, um, there was no company you could apply to to become an animator. We were just uh, we um, we founded our own company and just started doing it basically. Oh. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's. I'll I'll just finish that story sure, line sure, sure. for a little. Um, uh, we I ran that animation company with my uh, my friends for about 10, 11 years. Then the um, financial crisis happened in two thousand and eight. Uh, we were doing a lot of commercial work, so most of our clients um, didn't really need us anymore because when there's a crisis, the first thing you, uh, you cut out is, um, um, is commercials, obviously. But I was, I was kind of done with commercials. All right, let me bloody well stop this. By the way, for anyone who's listening, that's probably the sound of a notification from a system. So no worries about that. Your system is fine. Yeah. The sound isn't from your system. It's from our side. So for anyone who's yeah, yeah, listening. Sorry, so I'm, I'm trying to kill Slack here. Um, no, no worries. Yeah, killed. Um, basically, I already, I was kind of deviated from that path from wanting to be um, a fantasy illustrator because now I was an, a 3D generalist, which was very fun, but 
I was too much in, in, I was doing commercials and I wasn't enjoying myself anyway. So from that point on, I kind of converted myself to a concept artist, a freelance concept artist instead of a commercial 3D guy, basically. That, that's, that's the origin story. All right. Awesome. And well, in the introduction, I mentioned that you're a concept artist and in your art station also, it's written that you're a concept artist, but here's the thing. Um, so it's basically evident that your main branch of design is concept art, right? But what I want to know is that, you know, tell us about your experience from the start of it till now. Like, you know, that was before previously you mentioned and then answered the, your origin, you know, sorry, if you know what led you to become an artist, but now what led you to choose concept art, you know, as a profession, like to specialize in, you know, does that make sense? And that's the question right now. Okay, so the, the question is what led specifically to, to concept art? Yes, and the niche you're on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I always enjoyed uh, like the pre-production the most when I was still doing animation, so figuring out what, what it's going to look like, basically, like the, the sketches and the, the vis dev, like uh, test rendering, lighting, and all that. And then when that was done, in animation, you have to do the entire animation. So that for me, that was kind of like the the grunt work. Um, but I knew that this was the the most enjoyable part of any production for me. And also, um, in that time, the concept art was an actual becoming an actual industry. Like in two thousand eight, two thousand and ten, there were actual concept artists. I think I don't think ArtStation existed yet, but there was CG Hub and CG Society. And there were like images popping up there where some dude said, hey, look, I drew this in Photoshop. I was like, what? No way. Um, so that's when I started to become interested in it. And then it took me a really long time to figure out that being a concept artist isn't just being able to make nice drawings but to actually think about the ideas behind the, the story on the, the project that you're working on. So I was practicing techniques and, and stuff, and then I, um, I was freelance, so I was working for anybody who would hire me. And I started marketing myself as a concept artist, and I would, get, um, I would basically get illustration jobs from people who said, hey, we need concept art, and we need concept art of this exact thing so that that isn't actually concept art because that's if you already know what you want you don't need a concept artist basically if you know what it's what you want it to look like you so i i needed to figure out what what it was um and i needed to get better and just through practice and like um getting some jobs and learning on the job which is the the best way to learn i think it took me, um, I guess, three to five years to make that that transition from commercial 3D to, to concept art. And it was also a matter of finding the jobs because, um, like I said, the Dutch industry is not very, uh, is not big enough to actually need a lot of concept art. Because there's hardly any, uh, there's a couple of game companies that they have in-house concept artists and there's there's not a, a film industry that is has a lot has enough money to to employ a concept artist. So that was a, a journey as well. Um, but I, that I, I I managed quite quite nicely actually. Um, and last year, <clears throat> I was I was just sitting at home being a freelance concept artist, and particularly during COVID, I got a lot of jobs because um, I couldn't. I got a lot of jobs from outside of the Netherlands because everybody was working from home anyway. I suddenly had much more work and uh, much better paid work because, uh, well, um, the Dutch jobs didn't pay that well. Um, but then after like 10 years of sitting at home drawing on my own, I, I got really bored. And that's why I started working for, um, for Craft on Europe which is the, the company that makes PUBG. So I'm employed by them now. So I go into the office uh, three days a week. And that also 
helps me to understand concept art better because now I have colleagues that uh, give me feedback, which is useful. That's awesome. And how's the experience been so far, you know, working on PUBG? Ah, oh, it's really fun. It's, uh, it's great to just have, uh, like the team is very nice. My art director is great. The, the general vibe there is, uh, is quite nice. I'm a little freaked out though, because I'm, uh, I'm working in the world trade center, which is like this super posh, uh, gleaming tower of, of business. It's full of investment bankers and lawyers. And then there's a bunch of freaky guys with mohawks and game t-shirts and tattoos. So it's, it's a, it's a weird mix. So I'm, if I, if you would have told me I would be working in the world trade center, like, uh, five years ago, I would have laughed in your face. I was like, yeah, yeah no way. I'm used to working in, in basements with, uh, with no light and a bunch of, uh, dudes playing loud music. So it's a bit of a change. Yeah, I, I could just imagine. And well, let's go into, you know, and a little bit of technical question, which is how does your design process usually go anytime you want to start working on a new um, project or piece? Like, you know, basically, of course, I know for most people and artists, it, is, it differs between like personal work and, you know, work that you do professionally and job. Yeah, good but, point. Yes, exactly. But I want to know what does the structure of a the structure of your pipeline looks like, you know, for both of these, you know, uh, okay, yeah. separate paths. For, for both, right? Okay, so um, when it's a professional work, like client work or um, at my job, it's very streamlined and also very similar to what I think most um, concept artists who use 3D in their pipeline use. So first there's some reference gathering and, and some sketching. Then there's a lot of uh, either modeling or kit bashing or um, sometimes uh, sculpting 3D. I like to use Oculus Medium as well, like with the, the VR set and just uh, sculpting in, in VR because it's very intuitive, but only for organic stuff. Um, and then it's a, it's a very straightforward rendering a bunch of passes and Photoshopping on top of it, going back and forth between Blender and Photoshop because it's everybody's using Blender nowadays, which is great because uh, you can uh, you can swap tricks. Like in the old days, it's like ah, I found this new trick in uh, 3ds Max, and they're like, ah, well, good for you. I'm using Modo, so. Um, but it, it, it's like that. It's very, uh, very much the same as most other concept artists, like realistic 3D uh, concept art. However, on when I'm doing personal work, it's um, I I don't really start with an end goal in mind because I'm very when I'm doing personal work, I just want to have a good time. One, and I'm going for surprises so i want to be i if it works out I, I surprise myself it doesn't really mean that i have a very uh good looking image per se but i just want to enjoy the the process i want to learn some some new stuff usually and i want to i want to experiment a lot so i like to just do a bunch of weird textures on top of each other in Photoshop and distort those and then project those on 3D meshes and then pull vertices on them and do a bunch of random effects on those until I see something, uh, until I figure out what I'm making, basically. So I, I, I really just go in blind and go, rah, 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 and then like, ah, wait, I, did I see something. And then I, I might put in like three or four hours on that. And they're, no, I'm not doing that at all. I'm doing something else. And then like the whole, the whole thing is about just randomly bumping into new ideas or, or techniques until I find something that I like. And then I actually will finish it and sometimes make a nice image. But if I do personal work, I think like 40, 50% of the time I'm just making crap and I'm, I'm tossing it away. And I still think that's very valuable time spent because um, I've enjoyed myself. It's uh, it's very calming. 
there's no deadline. There's nobody watching me or uh, pushing me in any direction. I can just like if I've just watched, like I've just watched uh, Scavengers Reign, for example, the uh, animated series on HBO Max, and it's it's freaking brilliant. So then I'll I'll want to make something like that. So I'll figure out tricks to do to do similar stuff in Blender or or something like that. So there's no process in in my personal work. Deliberately, I don't want to have a process because I want to have. Uh, surprises basically all right and well you know there's you know a couple other questions you know i wanted to ask you know that could you know fall right into the subject as well but you know the first thing i want to ask is that um have you you know decided to add like something new that's never been done before to your workflow because i've seen you know on one of your you know works on um like our session the four horses of apocalypse you Kind of, I had uh, you used Mid Journey, and I actually had another artist like Till Frey talk like last year. He also implemented Mid Journey in his workflow pretty seamlessly. Like he gave some of a sample of his works to Mid Journey, and it gave a bunch of variations. And he mm. took that and he made a bunch of new like oral paints and you know like fleshed out something out of that. So that was really interesting to me. So I've seen you know you've done some you know interesting experiments in that regard as well. So could you tell us a little bit about your experience with you know using AI in your workflow? Yeah, um, I've been messing around with it since like 2019, I think. Uh, there's this website called it's now it's called Art Breeder. Back then it was called Gun Breeder. Um, it's it's still there. It's really nice. So I was just using it to generate weird stuff because back then it wasn't good enough to uh, to do realistic things. And later on, you had Disco Diffusion, which you have to run through a Google Colab. I was always interested in just fiddling with it because you had these... The mistakes that it made were actually what made it interesting because you would try and make a castle and you'd, you'd get sort of splattered paint with parts of a castle somewhere. I did a blog post on ArtStation about it. Uh, this was years ago. This was before everybody went, holy shit, uh, what the hell is happening? Um, I do use uh, Stable Diffusion now, which I, I can run it locally. And I like putting in images like my own stuff and then see what it does with that. But I'm, I've, I've become a little hesitant about it because um, in the beginning I was posting some, some AI stuff and uh, the, a bunch of artists reacted to that very emotionally and um, quite angrily. And I didn't really enjoy that. Uh, and this has been going on for the past couple of years. Uh, for example, I... Um, I was on a panel for the Playgrounds Festival in Amsterdam once, and there there was this whole discussion about AI, but it wasn't a discussion. Everybody was just going, oh, we have to cancel this, and we have to protest, and there's a, we have to sue them and everything, and copyright. And I agree with all of that. But there is a, there's an, a more interesting discussion to be had, I think. Um, I'm actually rambling. This isn't the answer to your question at all. <laughs> No, please do uh, go on, and this is actually yeah. getting interesting. Please, I don't want to stop you. Yeah, but um, well, the, my point was that I, I was trying to bring up um, like a counterpoint to um, to that stuff about copyright and suing uh, suing the Lion data set or the, the guys that made it. Um, but but nobody wanted to hear that. It was everybody was kind of looking at me like, uh, don't. Don't you say it? And I was like, okay, I'll just go along with this. But this is a, this is a bigger discussion that uh, we we can either have or don't have. Your your question was about the horses of the apocalypse. Um, oh yeah, your implementation of AI in the workflow. Because as I, as yeah. I mentioned, there's been people who have been doing that, and I'm kind of interested. You know how how well, I am trying to figure out. Uh, to be honest, it's really hard to do. Um, I find it very hard to do AI stuff implemented in my work and also enjoy the process because uh, sometimes you get something and it's just finished. 
and it's not mine. I didn't make it. I I can't do anything with it, or I don't feel like. So I'm trying to cut it up and use it in different ways. So I had some interesting results there, and I slapped it on uh, on a couple of planes and started playing with it in 3D until I um, I ended up with with that piece. But by the time it's finished, it's it's like eighty percent uh, like me doing stuff, and um, I don't know if it's eighty twenty. But like I don't want to just use it as is. I, I want to be able to to sort of transform it and make something that I want to make. Um, but that is pretty hard, but mostly because it's so so good right now. Um, well, mostly because it's become so sophisticated. It's not good necessarily as an art tool now because it kind of removes me from the equation. Like, And also, like was what I was saying before, the, the mistakes are actually what made it fun in the beginning. Nowadays, like a mid-journey image, you can recognize a mid-journey image because there's this mid-journey sauce. Uh and most of the stable diffusion stuff, everything starts to basically look like Disney Blizzard type of sort of... Uh, it, it's really hard to get anything um, experimental out of it. And in the beginning, all it was was experimental because it couldn't really do... It was so stunted that it couldn't really do uh, like proper hands or proper faces or proper anatomy or perspective or atmosphere or whatever. That's not a problem. We can do that. Like we've been trained to do, to do those things. So in a way, it's harder to use now as a tool than it was uh, before. On the other hand, there's there's a bunch of uh, Photoshop plugins, for example, that will just um, color your image in a really nice way. So it's uh, it's it's getting interesting. I'm. Uh, I'm very ambivalent about the whole thing, to be honest. It's like in the beginning, I was like, ah, oh, this is super interesting. And then I went to the old of the phases of, uh, of uh, fear, denial, uh, anger, and resignation. And now, and I've, I've used it a lot. Now I'm, I'm a little bit tired of it, but ha, you know, it's there. We're going to use it sooner or later anyway. Um, what do you think? Well, honestly, I've been thinking about it and discussing this for you know a year, two, yeah, two years now. It is, uh... and I think you know. In, first of all, I need to mention something that um, I hate radicalization in any form. I hate yeah. the tech pros on one side, and I hate the artists who you know just as suddenly they just see AI, they attack. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the most. Uh, that was quite shocking. Like, uh... yeah, people yeah. just. I don't know, like, you know, he, humans as a species is just pretty tribalistic, you know, yeah. we're monkeys at the end of the day, pretty societal yeah. tribalistic creatures, to be honest. We're quite uh, smart uh, when we're on our own, but when you put us in a group, it's, it goes down rapidly. And I'm uh, like, it goes for I most. Guess. <laughs> but I mean, mostly it's just people like to be like, as a part of their identity, they like to be a part of a group. Yeah. yeah. And one group is like, you know, oh, I'm team anti-AI. Oh no, I'm team AI. And oh, why can't you just not be in a part of a team and see something as it is? Like, I mean, all right, there's an artist who wants to use AI as a fun experiment or something, you know, sure, why not? But, you know, yeah. and they're, but at the same time, like, you don't, even though, sure, there, even you disagree with someone, you don't have to attack, right? Yeah, right? yeah, no, that's, I agree with that. But And there's obviously some things that you shouldn't do, like generate something and then say, hey, I drew this. It's like a... Uh, like a lot of yeah and and then the the tech bros i know exactly what you're talking about like there's it's hard not to have a radical opinion about uh, some of those uh forums um but like the whole discussion is uh it can be very interesting i think if you even if you if you go like beyond art for example the um, the, the copyright lawsuit that uh, Carla Ortiz and uh, a whole bunch of other people are doing, which is they should do that, right? I mean, this is like a, a copy. The scraping was, was not a good thing. 
Uh, it wouldn't have happened if it was the music business. Actually, it, it hasn't happened because I think people knew that uh, record companies are going to sue, whereas artists aren't. But let's do a scenario where the lawsuit wins. The, the, the Lion data set is eliminated, which is kind of impossible, but bear with me. And very strict copyright laws are implemented, right? Who has the most copyright for the most IPs? Disney, Warner Brothers, Blizzard, big corporations. So they are going to have the right to train data sets on all of those IPs, whereas the, like the small indie company making a game has no rights at all. So this creates a super huge uh, discrepancy between like, the big corporations and the indies in a bad way. And I'm not saying that it will play out this way uh, at all, but it's just like the impulse to sue and go for the copyright is a good impulse, but maybe the result won't be so good. We just don't know. Yeah, I agree. But in my opinion, I think, you know, AI could be in a, I think, you know, here's the thing. AI as a tool is amazing. And what I mean by that is if you, for example, as I, and I mentioned in this previous episode before, like, you know, if you have, for example, you're in a studio and you want to make it, for example, a sequel or a new project of your, from one of your current IPs. So of course you have a database of concept arts, illustrations, and everything's on that same IP. So you can feed that database to the AI and come up with, you know, quick little iterations of, I don't know, buildings, modular pieces, uh, sure. even characters and stuff like that. And you can quickly have a base to work off on as a pro- for a production settings, I think could be quite, you know, instrumental in to help, uh, mm-hmm. you know, develop to, you know, shorten the development cycles in a sense. And also, for example, for huge scale, like, you know, mega projects, like AAA projects, it could be useful. Like, for example, imagine you're an environment artist that you, that you have to, for example, make 12 settlements in a map and each of them has to have it follow a certain, like, you know, theme, but have different iterations. You can quickly come up with bases for that based off the references and pictures. For example, you have on your PRF or you know Pinterest, and you can just feed it to the AI and just come up with new ideas quickly. Yeah, I yeah. mean, as a base to start off, but of course, an expert artist should be available to make something out of those bases. So, at the end of the day, that's a good tool, right? Like, for example, yeah, right now, uh, a lot of like you know services have transcript services, like on YouTube, for example. They use AI for that. What I, what I'm talking right now, AI provide like I mean AI, YouTube with the AI that it has, it's going to provide the, like a rough estimation of what I'm saying as a subtitle right now on this episode. So yeah. these are amazing, you know, applications of AI. But at the end of the day, as we know, we live in a kind of like unfortunately kind of semi dystopian society right now. And anything that could lead to more profit for the shareholders of companies, it will happen. Yeah. If it means yeah. like laying off 10,000 people like in a couple of like months, who cares? As long as it's yeah. going to end up like the next couple of years, going to add some profit and value to the stocks of whatever, whichever company or something, you know, that's, you know, um, the shareholders have stocks in, right? Yeah. So at the yeah. end of the day, no one's going to create. Like, I recently saw a read from a CEO of uh, Sora AI. There's a woman who is a CEO, and they were asking her the most basic questions, like, you know, wh- how does, what databases does Sora AI use? And she was like, public domain. And the, the interviewer was like, so you mean YouTube? And she was like, I'm not quite <laughs> sure about that. And <laughs> the interviewer was yeah. so Instagram, Facebook, and all social media. And like, I don't know, you know, and these are the most basic questions, of course, she knows, but of course she's a CEO and she has to be careful with whatever she says technically. So, yeah. Um, But as we stand right now, um, there is actual concern to be had over, you know, the development of land implementation of AI in the industry. But at the same time, don't just try to tear someone down because they're using AI for fun or they just think it's a cool idea to use AI. I mean, yeah, 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 I, no. but there's one, I'm sorry, but before I, I'm just going to finish after this. Ah. There's just one exception that I have no issue with attacking them and being radical towards uh, the tech bros. 
And I don't care. <laughs> like, I absolutely don't care. Gross. I'm going to be You mean those guys that think that artists are gatekeeping art? Yes. Like that? Those exactly. guys? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I want to say, like, you know, there's just a bunch of mediocre artists that cry about, you know, like the element of AI or something, you know? And I know what you mean. Yeah. They're the same NFT bros who, who spent a lot of their mortgages or money on NFTs and they, they're now bored of shit. I don't know. I actually know some some actual really good NFT artists yeah. who managed to... I'm generalizing. To... I know, of course. I know yeah, as yeah. well. Uh, as of course, I'm kind of generalizing. But at the same time, you get my point, right? Yeah. No, but I think I think the, the problem is that sort of the runaway capitalism that we're in and not the technology. But it's like, it is quite bad. I've, jobs are gone. Like a lot of... Uh, I think it's harder to be a freelancer at the moment. And um, it's, uh, I hope that it, it kind of, that there'll be like a sunny side for, for artists uh, on the other end of this. And, uh, but I don't really see it right now. It's just uh, in my mind. Honestly, I think, you know, not in a quite a short term way, but I think right now, I think at least 90% of everyone's mindset when it, when it's come to like entering art as a, like, you know, path or something in life is to, of course, in the end, make money, which yeah. 100% that's the case for even me and everyone else, right? Most people, right? Um, but here's the thing. Sure, money is a real thing. And go for art, you know, and choose the job or title or position that's going to get you paid and you're talented in, for sure. But if you want to make money, there's easier ways. <laughs> than I know, art. but... For people who still want to stick with art, I think if you just at the same time have this underlying um, thought process that, all right, I want to express myself some way with art and I want to do something incredible with what I'm doing and have some sort of goal, big goal like that for yourself, you will eventually go down a path that leads you to a lot of self-exploration as an artist and experimentation that will lead you to create an interesting style. And that's what makes anyone in anything successful, yeah. a success story. So and AI... Point. And listen, AIs can, are not, I don't think, like, listen, any art cell that AI does, it's from based on another human artist's art cell. Yeah. And honestly, there can be infinite number of art cells with different nuances. It's going to get harder and harder and harder to come up with new different art cells. Sure. You know, because it takes more experimentation and work, you know, to, to get to something new. But I'm not saying that you shouldn't necessarily your art style should be something new or avant-garde or something to be a standout. No, you just have to yeah. be yeah. like perfect, like something like, you know, fundamentals. Like if you see a lot of like art styles, they're, they're not perfect in every realm of like, you know, fundamentals of art, but they're usually super like interesting and great. In usually one or two. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it does. There's a, uh, when you just said, like the, when you just started that sentence, like the, if you you go on the, on an art journey because you're curious and you're you're exploring, my fear with AI and what I felt when it I saw it like get really good is oh my, why bother, you know why why bother learning to draw and do do all that exploring and learning if if I can just type something and an image will roll out. I was, and I still am uh, a little scared that people will just, uh, especially kids will, will just not want to learn to draw or, uh, or sculpt or, uh, or anything anymore. However, um, I have two kids and the oldest is on in an art school right now. He doesn't feel uh, blocked in any way by AI. So, and I don't think his classmates do either. Uh, and, uh, so that's maybe it's a it's a unbased fear. That's nice. Yeah, but also there's a bit of a grandpa uh, comment I would like to make about. Um, I think there there's a, it's so easy to see a lot of amazing art. Like regardless of the AI stuff, if you go to art station or wherever, you get like millions of, of images that are all super good. Whereas um, when I was drawing uh, and trying to learn to draw in the 90s, there was no internet. I would go to uh, like the American Book Center or uh, secondhand bookshops and buy illustration books and I would discover some some illustrator that I liked and then I would just spend the next year trying to draw like that because there was no other input. Like 
this is the shit. I'm gonna learn this. Uh, I wasn't distracted by any any new stuff like that meme with the girl and the other girl and like the distraction. It wasn't there. There was like a minimum of input. So if you found something you liked, you milked it for all it was worth. And that was actually quite useful uh, because you just took the time to to pursue that that one path till the end. Like, okay, I've I've taken my inspiration from this. Now I'm ready to move on with with something else. Whereas now it's just like a three second scroll uh, thing that I find very uh, hard to deal with. Like I, I turn off all my social media a lot of the time and I don't want to look as much at other people's work except for the like my colleagues and the, the stuff that I'm working on at work. I try to limit my input because otherwise I get so overwhelmed that I'm not inspired anymore. And well, this, the same goes for, for AI. It's too easy. There's so much. Like, you can make like a, a billion images in, in a week. It's, uh, it's not fun anymore. So that was my, my rant. All right. And I mean, to recap everything, it's just, you know, try to have this mindset as well, you know, to generally approach art as the mindset of wanting to explore and find your voice in it to express yourself. Like that's my real thing because that will lead to really cool results that you wouldn't even expect. But when you're always worried about your portfolio and resume and getting that job and everything, it's like, you know, there's, there was this, I think, you know, Olympic archer, or I think, you know, there's this, not archer, like I think there was this, another sport that you use a gun in Olympic with air guns, something like right. that. I don't know. Maybe it was archer. I don't know. But they, it gave like a very interesting story of, you know, when I think it was a girl who won gold medal and she told the story, of, you know, what, what was her, her thought process? She was like, I wasn't looking at the goal or the thing I need to, I was just focusing on the leaves that were blowing over the board, actually. I was just looking at that, getting relaxed and my instincts just fired and I got the perfect score. And how does it relate to the story is just basically if you if you keep, you know, hyper focusing on the results, which is like, you know, getting that good paying, you know, job and stuff like that, that is not that dream is right now being threatened by AI, supposedly. If you keep focusing on that, you will miss the actual process of, you know, what makes a good artist, right? So well, you'll, just, you'll miss the fun of the journey. I mean, I, yes, I'm not even too. sure if it's going to make you a good artist. Exactly. But it, it's not even the point. The, po- the point, in my case, at least, is just to entertain yourself and to learn stuff. Um, and it's in- inevitable that you become better while you're on that path. Because everything you repeat, you just get better at. Um, yeah, I mean... So- And all of this stuff might sound really sappy and, you know, super optimistic or something, but it's not necessarily isn't. I'm not actually the most optimistic person people usually say I am or my friends know me. I'm quite pessimistic, actually. But the truth is, like what I'm saying is I genuinely believe in them. And that's why I'm not even worried about, you know, my future, because I want to be a 3D environment artist in the future Uh at some point in the industry. And so, yeah, just focus on, you know, putting out your best work putting out your base expression, what it can be recreated, and the rest will, you know, fall into place. That's genuinely my opinion, you know, because I don't think art is going anywhere at all. No, I don't think art is going anywhere either, but the business side of it is uh, is, is very interesting and uh, is changing really fast right now. Actually, I would make the argument that even with the fact that there's a lot of, like, cool layers right now, we are in a shortage of cool ideas these, at this moment. I, I'm generally going to claim that. Well, we, yeah. I mean, look at Hollywood. There's a sequel after prequel after... Uh, even though I think we're in the golden age of animation. Like, I literally... I just... I'm watching Blue Eye Samurai, which is just like a mainstream Netflix. And it's freaking awesome. It's really good. It's like what I was crying for uh, like 10 years ago when animation was still mostly for kids but we've got love death robots we got like the scavengers reign which really in my opinion is sort of the holy grail of animation i mean it looks like mobius and I'm, a, I'm a huge mobius fan the story is fantastic as well like i i discover new cool stuff pretty much uh, weekly now and it's uh 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not worried about art. I'm, I'm worried about uh, artists making a living. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, but and I was always, I mean, that's always been a thing, right? If yeah. you're an artist, you're not going to be uh, a millionaire instead, unless you're like one of the few. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's a weird topic, but I mean, right now in this world, if you're not an entrepreneur in any shape or form in what you're doing, you're not going to be a millionaire, which is like a weird topic to say. Yeah, I do miss that. When I was freelance, I always had this fantasy, like I could have the million dollar job or, or, or some opportunity that would make me actually uh, like uh, make enough money to not worry about it for a while. And um, I, I do miss that that fantasy. Well, I mean, it's, it's always like kind of like, you know, fun exercise to always talk to yourself whenever you, you want to do something like, you know, hmm. Technically, if I actually want to make a million dollars in savings, what should I do? And that leads you to a path of like learning a lot of stuff. And, in, and not just with making money with anything, you know? Yeah, but that, like, that means you have to put a lot of thought in it. And that means yes, you're, you're like all of your, your energy is going towards how do I make that money? I don't want to do that. Like my, my time is short. I need to do better you know? stuff than that. Yeah, for some people, it's fine. It's like a video game. It's like literally like in a video game that you have to build up a business or something. They, some people see it like that. Like, and it's kind of interesting, you know? Yeah, I, I, should have, I should have learned that like uh, when I was younger because I was always like follow your heart and do whatever you want and the rest will come naturally. It doesn't. You have to think about money if you want to have money. So I learned that really late in in life when my company crashed, basically, because before that, everything was going quite nicely and I didn't really have to bother uh, myself too much with it. Um, but I think if you, if you want to get rich, you have to put in a lot of effort to get rich, which takes away from putting effort into other stuff. And I can't be arsed to do that. I'm, as long as I'm not hungry and I can feed my family, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Like at the end of the day, we all want to live a happy life. And that doesn't mean you should have a million dollars or something. Honestly. No, even though it's uh, like paying five like bucks a for a cup of coffee right now. Is, is... Yeah, the thing is that it's just a brainwashing of society to, of it at some point as well. Like that we all have to be rich to be happy. We all have to have the highest thing to be happy, which I think is like, uh, little, like you know... Dude, uh, my parents were hippies. I was never... Told awesome, that, man. that money makes That's you happy. Right, actually, <laughs> it was kind of uh, you couldn't. It's it's forbidden to talk about money. It's like a taboo subject. So um, uh, That's except crazy. my mom, yeah. Well, it, it's it's partly great. I mean, it would have been cool if I knew that that money is actually <laughs> important. Uh, oh, yeah, I was on the other side of that as well, but I mean. That's that's actually a really interesting topic, you know. But the, but I assume like you know most people in first world countries don't really have that you know itch to make money than people who are born from third world countries. This is a pattern I've seen usually. Um, yeah, because for if many you have reasons, enough, mostly. Uh, yeah, sorry, go on. No, but if you have food and a roof over your head, um, you don't really need to bother thinking about it too much. Uh, I, I do feel I'm uh, like lately it, everything's become insanely insp- expensive uh, in the Netherlands. And I think all over the world, it's uh, there's something going on. So I think, I think um, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but I think people are thinking about it now. Like even if you were comfortable earlier, right now you, you suddenly can't pay for gas for your car or something. It's, there's a kind of a wait what what happened thing going I don't think even it's about like having a like, roof or food over your like have a roof over your head and food and everything you know available and that doesn't make you like you know not to have that haste to like you know like you know have that itch for making money but it's not just that it's kind of related but at the same time like you know um it's just people from virtual world countries that have really bad economic situation. There's so much corruption. There's like, you know, so many bad stuff always happening. There's always yeah. this instant itch in everyone since they're born to get out of here and not be associated with that place. And how do you disassociate from that place? If you get associated with another 
better place, which is like when you get a passport or a permanent residence of another country, a good country. And to get there, actually, you need to make a lot of like, you know, sacrifices and make a lot of money. And you have to do a lot of like, you know, side hustles and everything to get there for a lot of people, you know? Okay. And you have to have a, a certain amount of like economic brain to invest for your future, you know, in these countries. But I think, you know, when you're born in America or, you know, Europe, you... You're kind of already spawn, like in a video game where you spawn in different locations. Sometimes your character, and you know if, when you're spawning somebody, let's say Norway, for example, you don't have to worry about your passport strength. You don't have to worry about you know necessarily uh, how some things are. You know when it comes to your living situation or standards. That's why you really don't have that necessity. You make good money. You can live. The standards are nice. You know why would you need extra? Honestly, and not just that. It's also this thing that's. Oh my god! I think I, I just forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> no, like I've I've obviously spawned in the privileged uh, position in the game in the Netherlands, where I didn't have to worry about my passport or um, my art education uh, and and that sort of thing. So I think this is really, and I do recognize what you're saying is that some of my colleagues coming from uh, I have a, a good friend coming from Romania, and I. I kind of recognize what you say. Um, and I'm wondering, well, this is a hard question to answer, I, I guess, uh, if it's worth it. Like, is it so much better if you may, if you, if you do all this, all the schemes and you make it out and you, you live in the Netherlands or in Germany or something? I'm, I'm just genuinely interested if life is actually better in those places because my fantasy now is to get the fuck out of here and live in egypt or indonesia or somewhere that has nice really? weather and a and an actual ocean yeah look i like the netherlands but it's one big parking lot it's asphalt everywhere it's super oh crowded God. everything is fucking expensive like there's serious stress about just being able to afford basic shit now and you work and work and work and the whole thing is just to to continue existing well, so, that's a good point actually um to answer your first part, it's absolutely worth it because okay. you're tied to a country that's not that doesn't seem to have a really good future. That's why you know it's better to you know just be tied so to somewhere else. In, into the future, it's like if you stay here, your situation is n- is not going to get better. Uh, bear with me for a second. Like here's the thing. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> like you know when you, for example, let's say Romania, right? I don't think Romanian passport has like passport is a really key word here, right? I don't think mm-hmm. Romanian passport has a, like a incredible strength in terms of like how yeah, many countries can you travel visa free but for example a dutch visa like netherlands we passport has i think it's rank number five or six in the strength no, in the it's, it's below but i've seen the list and it's like it's up there in yeah. as a, like a desirable passport i know yeah and not just that when you do that you're basically free to travel anywhere it's much easier to get job opportunities or you know study opportunities or just anything else and the, even though you can make a lot of because of the, all the thirty percent tax and everything in Netherlands, for example. You make a little bit of saving when you send that back yeah. to your friends or family back home. It's going to be a lot for them because of the economy. So all in all, there's a lot of huge you know pros for that. But to answer your you know also the subject that you mentioned that you want to go to somewhere else like Egypt or Indonesia or something like that. There's a couple of interesting points about that. One, like you know, I live in Istanbul for the past five years. It's, it's nice, you know, but at the same time, you know, as humans, we crave variety, right? We we can't, if you stay somewhere for too long, it gets fucking boring. You know, it's, for example, your case, Netherlands. So I understand that. But at the same time, it's also the fact that um, you probably love visiting deserts that have, you know, interesting, like, you know, ancient, like, for example, in Egypt, ancient, you know, pyramids and stuff like that. It's nice to visit and stay for a while. But you go there with the thought in mind that you're always safe, that if it doesn't work out, there's always back home Netherlands, a safety net. But when we don't have that safety net, we have a danger pit behind us when we have the passport of our original country. That's the difference. That's why we need a safety net first so we can risk, if that makes sense. Right? Yeah, it makes sense. It, it's about the passport. It's about... Uh, and I, I want to as well. <laughs> I want to live in Egypt, but I want to have my my Dutch passport. Exactly, you're not going to yes. pick that up. No, it's still the the privileged uh, position. I'm uh, I'm learning here. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my pleasure, man. I love you know having this you know arguments you know with people. Not no not arguments, discussions. No arguments. Yeah, yeah. 
conversations. Yeah, uh, conversations. I really do need. To, I'm, I really am listening. Uh, I've I've got a, an Egyptian friend, and he, he uh, explained to me about the passport. I was I, like you said, if you have it, you don't have to think about it. I was completely shocked that not everybody is free to travel everywhere they want. I was like, what the fuck? Why not? So yeah, privilege. Yeah. In the past five years, I got rejected for Canada three times. Yeah, yeah, but Canada is like a there's a hard country even uh, for everybody else to get into. It's kind of like a, it's like a literally listen. It's like a coin toss when they want to give you a visa, because mm-hmm. my mother and my two older brothers they all get visa, but I got rejected three times. Yep. Yeah. Okay, that's very random. Exactly, and I've seen a lot of these cases mostly for people who have like a, in a family of like multiple people. If you're, mm-hmm. for example, have multiple siblings, the first ones usually get the visa very fast, but the later ones get visa really hard. Like it's going to be a lot hard for them because the Canadian government says, for example, oh, these people, uh, he or she, her or his brother or sisters have stayed in Canada for multiple years and they didn't return back to their original country. So this one wants to do the same. So we're not going to let them in. Ah, uh, right. Yeah. Okay, and so basically your really chances weird. go down. The more siblings you have, <laughs> your chances go down. It's as well. kind of like a weird situation, right. but it's true. Do you have a plan in uh, in the broader scheme of things, where you want to live or where you want to work? Or, oh, yeah, uh, Netherlands. Yeah, hopefully, Netherlands. as I mentioned. Yeah, yeah. You're the, after the studies, you would want to stay here? Mm, if, actually, uh, no, to be honest. Like, but I want to like, <laughs> Listen, listen, listen. I know, like, it sounds like weird because of the conversations we had, but you know, there's like, if I had, if I had, all right, the questions that should be asked is this if you had like, you know, million dollars and like, like, if you're a millionaire, not just one million dollars, because in this economy, you need to have like, you know, at least 10 million dollars to buy a proper house or something mm-hmm. somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Million dollars is like from 20 years ago. All right. <laughs> and uh, in that situation, I actually would have preferred America, mostly North America. Um, Northwest states like Seattle, Washington State, and Oregon, Montana, like because I love those places. The natural, okay. like, I'm a huge, you know, hiking, you know, nat- natural, like nature loving type of guy. So I right. love being outdoors. And those places are the most beautiful, Same. like, natures I've seen. Like, ah, if I yeah. could even live in it, is that I hate America, uh, the government, the, everything about it. But, It'll change. Yeah. Hopefully. But, um, I love the nature and the, yeah, like the yeah. communities there. I understand. Yeah, and that's why I want to go to Egypt or Indonesia. I want to be near like a really nice ocean with corals and sharks and uh, do a lot of free diving and scuba diving and stuff. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, it's all about the nature. Yeah, and that's why that. I want to leave here because I li- <laughs> this literally is we have a we have nice islands. There's a bunch of islands in the north of the Netherlands that are quite nice and the rest is uh, so-so. Let's just keep it, leave it at that. Yeah, I've heard that a lot. It's actually funny you mentioned that, you know, Netherlands is just a huge parking lot. And well, because- there's a bunch of, the, we do have some old forest in the middle around Utrecht mm-hmm. and like the, there's the fields, but um, it's, it's just very uh, cultivated. Like there's no, no, there's nothing wild here. So every time I go out of the Netherlands, literally, if I go into Belgium, I go, oh my God, they have hills. Uh, there's something wildish about it, and that's what we lack. And yeah, uh, variety is just flat. Yeah, especially as artists, we need stimulation and variety. Oh yeah, definitely. And yeah, that's that's really an interesting point. Um, but the good thing is, when you enter like a European Union country, you can basically travel the whole area pretty easily. So oh, that's yeah. good for us. Yeah, that is also, that is true. That's very simple. I don't, uh, you don't even get checked much at the border. It's just, it feels like it's just one big uh, thing in terms of borders. It's, uh, oh, yeah. And all right. So let me actually go back to our topic about arts again, um, if that's okay. Do you have anything to add on to our previous topic, by the way? No, not really. All right. No. So the next question is, who are some of your favorite artists and designers that have inspired you the most? I think on the top of the list is Mobius, uh, Jean Giraud. He, um, I think if you look behind me, there's this, this image here. It's one of his, but it's also um, 
a drawing of Tetsuo from Akira, which brings me to Otomo. So basically, Mobius and Otomo for me are, are super important. Um, and then there's like those two, and then there's a some drop off, and then like a huge list of uh, of other artists that that we that goes on and on. But I'm gonna keep it at those two because they're the they're the top bunch. Also, kind of Frank Frazetta is still uh, still trying to get up there in the pantheon. <laughs> All right. And what are you working on right now that you can tell us about? What kind of project is it? I mean, of course, if there's NDAs involved, we can skip right past this question. Yeah, I get in but, real trouble if I, uh, yeah, if I talk I, about anything I imagine, uh, yeah. game-related. At least, is, you know, what personal stuff could you, are you doing right now that you can tell us about? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very slowly crunching on a, on a comic that I want to draw, but it's... I'm writing the story, then rewriting it. This will take years. And I've noticed that since I started um, like having an actual job as an employee, I haven't done much personal art. I think partly because I was, uh, I was a little motivated by getting jobs. So I would make an art piece. I would post it on ArtStation and LinkedIn. And usually I would get some kind of message from somebody asking, hey, uh, that was nice. Can you... Can we work with you? Um, so I don't really have any any theme apart from the from the comic that I'm working on, and I just get like after my my working day is done, I, I play Hades and I watch uh, some Netflix, and I'm kind of in a lazy period because usually I was always very uh, like fired up to just work until I uh, I fell asleep, and. Like it's it's going on for a year now, so I should probably get off my bum again and do something. But I'm kind of enjoying the not having to to think about it for a while. Um, so, but I, I'm always just scribbling in sketchbooks and uh, on Procreate while I'm on the train on my commute, for example. So there's still some output, but it's it's just very random. Yeah, and are you excited for the Hades 2? That's an upcoming Super Giant game. Well, I finally beat beat Hades last night, so oh, I'm nice. uh, like, for the first time. Or you did yeah the, like, for the first time. It took oh, me right. it took me a while. Like I'm not a very accomplished gamer. Like uh, this this stuff, I'm a little slower than uh, <laughs> my kids, for example. But I am enjoying it a lot. I am excited for Hades 2. I think it's one of the like the game mechanics were so good of of the first game that. Um, I'm excited, yeah. And listen, I'm just going to say this without a spoiling. You need to finish this game 10, 15 more times to get the actual ending. Like, at least, I think. Yeah, I was kind so of the many... first time. I was like, I'm getting bent, sent back again? Bloody hell. But I, it's still addictive, so I, I know I'm going to finish it. It'll get but... easier, actually. Like, okay. you know, if you upgrade everything, it'll get but easier. But there is an actual ending different than the one I've seen? Yep. After, okay, okay. If you're like me and you don't want to put up with that, you can just go on YouTube and watch the ending for yourself. <laughs> I've put too much effort into it for now. Now I, I want right, <laughs> to do this on my own. Makes sense. Yeah. Right, that's good. And I have a question, like, actually, it's kind of like... You know, not related to the podcast necessarily, but I'm genuinely curious as someone who has, you know, much more life experience than me. Um, I have, a, I, I'm going to turn 27, like in a couple of months. And there's something I've been noticing since like, you know, the last couple, two, three years. And it's kind of interesting and funny at the same time for me to say this, but does, why does it get harder to wake up? Actually, <laughs> why is that a thing? Because when I was 15, 16, I would just jump back, jump up from my bed like a spring. But now I, I'm fatigued all the time. I know it's a lack of exercise and a lot of like lifestyle choices. Yes, but I've noticed this as a pattern. Like every year, it gets harder to wake up. Like I could go on like with two, three hours of sleep and boom, nothing's wrong, you know? But right uh, now, if I even if I have my eight, nine hours of sleep, I'm still like a zombie. <laughs> If you have know. if you have consistent eight nine hours of sleep and you still feel like a zombie, maybe you're just working too hard, and like you said, you you need to uh, go out into the into the sun and have a run or something. Touch grass, yeah. Touch grass. Uh, put your head in the, in a river or whatever. Um, 
but I don't, I, I don't know, man. This is a, it's a biological question. I know that I find it hard to get up, but that makes sense. I'm nearly 50 and I'm like, uh, and I know that, um, I, I value my sleep like 10 times more than I used to when I was, uh, I was your age. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll pull an all nighter. No problem. Um, I won't do that now, but I think yeah. you're just going through a, through a phase and it'll pass. Yeah. Ho- hopefully yeah, I oh, definitely well. should have started, you know, going yet. Yeah, yeah. Because my sleep cycle has been off the rails for the last couple of months, actually years, to be honest. Mm. And I've been just forcing myself. Listen, energy drink pre workout, melatonin for nights. So, uh, yeah. this yeah. isn't particularly a healthy lifestyle, and I don't encourage it at all. But this is what's been going me through because if I don't actually do all this stuff, I can't get any work done. I see. But you do get a lot of work done. You've told yes. me how many podcasts you do, and um, I it's have impressive. To- so like if I could get my hands on like some of that, you know, good stuff, I could maybe, you know, even be more productive. I don't want to mention his name, but it's usually made in Colombia. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, yeah, because funny thing about this, actually right now every service right now has AI that listens to every podcast, right? Every every audio. And if I mention right, anything yeah. that's sort of related, I might my episode get might get flight. It's a real thing and it's kind of scary as well. <laughs> That is really paranoid. Yeah, exactly. But, but what what would be the consequences? You get fired by whom? No, I, mean, I don't get fired. I'm just my episode gets flagged. They say you have to edit it out. Or oh, right, right, right. You it get has fired. a potential to you know. I misunderstood. Yeah, because you 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 mentioned certain words in your podcast. Yeah, listen, your <laughs> thing. I recently had a podcast guest from China, and he was showing me something on Google Meet, and for a second he brought up his Instagram. And because he did that, the AI that was overseeing our call suddenly, and it was just a local Chinese thing, Chinese government thing, it yeah. cut out our call. Yeah, because yeah, why? Yeah. Because Instagram is filtered there, and the call was on Instagram. Yeah, that's the that's the big firewall, man. Like the yeah. Chinese. Uh, it's actually they impressive did, that, they, that they've made in an instant, practice. in a second or two, they literally it detected. And but they're billion. censoring a billion people. It's amazing <laughs> that, they, that they manage at all. It's impressive, yes, but at the same time, terrifying. It's not a good thing, but yes. yeah. yeah. Ah. Jesus, it is kind of a dystopic, cyberpunky uh, yeah. world. Yeah, I oh. wonder, you know, if they're going to, yeah, like, I mean, if anyone wants to also live off the grid, they, they can easily be found. Like, you know, no one get, can't escape right now, unless... We live underground in caves. Uh, if you if you're not spending any money, you can be you can disappear. No, no, no. But if let's say we're going actual in an actual like dystopian like you know future that they want to round up all humans, okay. it's easy to f- find everyone. Like just get a really advanced like heat signature like you know camera, and find the he- average heat signature of any human that you see in the world, and you get all the people off the grid as well. So there's no rebellion. Yay! Unless you go into bunkers underground, sure. this is this is turning out to be a plot of an interesting, like you know, story actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's uh, let's continue on that and work on some scripts. Mm. No, it is, but it went it went pretty dark uh, quickly too, and it's not even a, a fantasy so much anymore. That's kind of that kind of weirds me out. I I read those cyberpunk books in the like late eighties, the William Gibson, the Neuromancer, and the. There's a whole bunch of them. And it it really woke me up in the sense that um, I thought, oh, the world is much more interesting than I thought. It was really, uh, I was very much into it. It was very cool. But then it was, it still was, uh, it was sci-fi. And then slowly it it all sort of came through in a way. And now it's not so fun anymore. (laughs) Yeah, it's getting uncomfortable. We're getting uncomfortable close to some of those scenarios, but we have to wait and see what happens. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. So, I mean, regardless of what happens, trying to enjoy whatever life you might have, I'm doing the same. Honestly, that's all we can do. Oh yeah. No, it, it won't stop me from, uh, from enjoying. I mean, even if it is a, it's, it's a dystopic, um, weird thing. I'm still enjoying the, the weirdness of the story of it. Like, yeah, that doesn't really have to be 
comfortable all the time to still enjoy it. But at the same time, I would like to uh, kind of like fix the plastic from the oceans and um, make sure that there's some creatures left for my kids. So, yeah. and by the way, I, 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 I yeah. And I would like to apologize to everyone who's having an existential crisis right now. I yeah, sorry guys, uh, that wasn't the goal. <laughs> that wasn't the intention at all. Let's let's do some cozy art talk. Uh, yeah, <laughs> actually, the next question is kind of in the same way, which is, okay. in your experience of you know working professionally, like in the past couple of decades, what are some of the golden rules that you've that you can tell anyone who wants to get into the same position as well or into the industry as well? of working as a concept artist? What are some most important lessons and golden rules that you can give? Um, well, you're always working with people. So be a nice person, like be open, be fun to work with, like have fun while you're working, uh, if at all possible, but also um, try to help each other out because that way everybody is uplifted. And it, it, this also sounds very sappy, I know, but it's this is the golden rule in the sense that it's also very self-serving in the sense that this is what gets you hired again. If you were fun, even if you weren't the best, but you were still, you were like, you got your shit done on time and you were fun to work with. That's, I think, more important than being uh, the very best of, uh, of something. Um, golden rules are I'm still figuring those out man it's uh, my my golden rule is that I want to enjoy myself in, in any job even um, even if I, I now have uh, job security because I'm working in the games industry but there's like rounds of people being fired left and right so there's no there's no, oh that's a golden rule actually uh, I worked that out while mostly being freelancers. There is no such thing as security. Like sometimes there's a relative period of the security, but then everything changes all the time. So don't get too comfortable in any uh, situation. Uh, that doesn't sound very nice, but if you're cool with not being comfortable, you're pretty much comfortable all the time. So it's a kind of a Zen Buddhist uh, type of deal there. Um so have fun is uh, for me. If I don't have fun anymore, I'll change my situation. And I'm pretty confident about that. Like uh, I've done that in the past. I know that I can probably do it again. But then again, I I'm quite um, I have fun in most of the art related jobs. So it's easy for me to have fun. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. Awesome. And. Um... Now, here's the thing. What area beside the area you're working in right now, which is, of course, art-related, which you're the concept artist, of course, would you be interested to explore and learn in the future? Basically, what other non-art-related stuff you got going on in your life that are completely non-art-related? Okay, okay, okay. Um, well, last... In 2000, 2020, I learned to scuba dive with my family. And... Um, we all got very addicted to that. But then I discovered free diving, which is just diving as deep as you can on a single breath. So no, uh, you don't take any oxygen with you. So you just hold your breath and there's a line and a, like a buoy on the surface and you go down to the line and you try to go as deep as possible. And I got completely addicted to that. Like for tomorrow morning at, at 10, I'll be in a, in a lake in Holland somewhere and it's cold and it's dark. And the deeper you go, the colder it gets. But I'm, I'm looking forward to it already because it gives you such an amazing feeling in, in some weird way. So now I'm completely obsessed with trying to hold my breath for as long as I can. And I train every Wednesday night in a pool trying to, it's basically just underwater swimming as far as you can with, uh, with fins or without fins. So I'm, I'm very, uh, very into free diving and there's a whole nice community, um, in free diving as well. Like I meet a bunch of really cool people. Um, and, and we're all kind of obsessed lunatics that are like jumping in lakes uh, in the winter even. 
just to get like a couple of minutes in at like 30 meter where everything is dark and, and still you, you just hang there and you go oh now i gotta get back up but there's some there's you have to be super relaxed because if you're um if you're stressed your brain takes most of the oxygen if like if you think real hard that that um consumes a lot of oxygen weirdly so if you take a breath that br- the, the oxygen is dis- distributed in your blood and if you're super stressed you're just going to be able to hold your breath for for less long so you have to be very mellow and very calm so you're you're sort of diving down and saying like a mantra in your head and trying to be as calm as possible and if if it works if you have one good dive your whole day is is brilliant it's all it's all good so that's what one thing about the and, diving hmm? how does your like you know because one thing like I've, I don't have like, you know, of course, experience in this, but I've always been curious like about divers who don't go really deep. Like, because mm-hmm. when I used to like swim in the pools, uh, when I would go to like four meters, for example, my head would start to ring. Your ears will uh, will hurt you very badly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. How yeah. does your body get used to that as you keep lower and lower? As no, you no, down? this is the, in the beginning, the, that's the hardest problem is you, you swim down, then the pressure from the water is, is too much because there's, a little air in your head, but the, the pressure on your eardrums is so hard that it hurts really bad. So you have to equalize, and you do that by pinching your nose, and then um, basically blowing out uh, air, but it can't go anywhere, and that makes your ears pop. The same if you're in a plane and you, like your ears uh, start to hurt, you have to go, or you have to swallow or something. So while we swim down, we always we have one hand on our nose you're constantly equalizing because every meter you go down the pressure is uh um it's it's like every 10 meter the pressure goes up one bar so in the same way your every lungs, 10 meters for me it's like every two meters yeah yeah yeah. i know but one bar is a, is really a, a lot is, is very is a lot of pressure so you have to equalize every meter you're you're like you swim a little equalize 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 and you have to keep doing that when you go down, um, even if you go down to 70 or 80 meters, the, the the difference in the pressure is lower when the deeper you go. So the first five meters are actually the hardest. So once you, le- you learn the trick of equalizing, you can get past those four meters and you can go to 10 you or 70, 80 meters. Yeah, there's people do. I've, I've got a friend who goes down to 75 meters, which is insane. Um he hasn't ever had any consequence of that like on his body like the pressure of it of course it should be really no it turns out we have um the theory is that we used to be water creatures like way in the past um when you go into the water and you put your face in and you especially if you hold your breath there's a, a thing called the mammalian dive reflex which um it, it has it, it does a couple of changes in in your body and one is it slows down your heart rate and the other is that um, your blood goes to towards the center and less to the extremities just for uh, it's easier to maintain your uh, your energy that way so there's a, a couple of interesting things happening but in terms of pressure the apparently we can just go down to the, the the world record is 136 meters right now on a single breath like no uh, because with scuba you can go down even further but the pressure doesn't really um, um, mess you up in any way but there is there's a danger of blacking out underwater so you have to you always do it with a buddy and if you do like competitive or super deep dives, you actually have a team of people uh, that, that watch out for you when you do it. I can rant on about this for a long time. No, no, no. Cool. This is actually I'm fascinating for me. That's why I asked. Uh, this is a huge, huge, interesting rabbit hole for me. Yeah. Like I, I'm, I've always been really interested in like holding breath. Like to me, that's something that's safe relatively, right? You keep mm, like yeah. you know, oxygenating yeah, yeah. your blood and you keep holding your breath and you realize that, wait, I can do like five minutes now. Like my record one time was four minutes and 40 seconds. Dude, but that's it, better than me. But right, right cool. now I can, I can do like one minute and 40 seconds. Yeah, you, right you can now. train that. Yeah, yeah, I know. But to me, that's such an interesting. It's like free training with, like, you don't have to do anything. Just watch YouTube and just practice like your lung capacity. 
Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. But the deep dive thing is kind of scary to me. Like I, I was yeah, for me too. I was I was even very scared of scuba diving when I started because I remember we were in Greece and we we were going to dive a cave and it was ten meters down and then six meters horizontal, and I thought it was super scary because it was like this big black hole and I was supposed to swim in it and I was I was just uh, generally scared, and then like a year and a half later I'm like. I can do that without air. I can do that on a single breath. It's just 10 meters down, six meters forward. It's easy. So it's very cool for me that uh, you, you, you basically, um, how do you say that in English? Uh, um, your, um, your borders are uh, moving now. You're it's adapting. Up. Yeah, you're, you're just growing. Like, yeah. um, and it's it's very, the, the free diving is super good for my, my mental health, basically, because there's uh, so many things to stress out about that this practice really helps me because you I, it's, it's like hardcore meditation training. You have to go down, you're very stressed, but you can't be stressed because if you're, if you're stressed, you can't go any further. So it's like you have to learn how to let go very quickly. It's like... Stress, no, let go. Stress, let go. So that's why I think if you have a good dive, the rest of your day is, is like done. There's nothing that can bring you out of balance anymore. And that's one ex- aspect that I really like about it. But for scuba diving, it's super relaxing as well because you're just floating. You, have, you literally have the feeling that you fly. Everything moves super slow. The noises are very uh, muffled and, and weird. It's, it's very psychedelic, but without any... Uh, of those substances from that country. Or... Yeah, but there's at the same time my fear of thalassophobia. Like, I don't like, of thalassophobia. It's like fear of huge deep sea creatures that you can't oh, see. Right. Like, listen, yeah. if it's a pool or lake that is clear and I can see the bottom, I'm Gucci. I'm fine. But yeah, if it's something that's dark and I can't see, it, my imagination goes wild. But listen, yeah, I know. right now, I I'm that too. Yeah, sorry, go on. Uh, I, I had that too. It just the the it goes just, away. It goes away. I swear. Like I was, right. uh, you would you would be snorkeling, for example, and then there's like a big drop off, and then just nothing, like big black hole everywhere. And I would I would be super scared of that. And now I want to go in. Like I'm that triggers me to go down. It's like yeah, there's a big black hole. Let's go. It's really weird because I was I, I seriously was scared of that and I sort of adapted uh, to it. That's interesting. I don't think I will, yeah. but that's <laughs> I'm willing to give it a try. Though. You don't like, have not, to. Yeah, like yeah. Another one is like this. Another phobia was uh, that was you know related to this was the phobia of seeing mega structures under the water, hmm. like you know abandoned huge ships or. Yeah. Or, or cranes or you know that that sort of instills a certain fear in me as well like it's yeah. such an uneasy unnerving feeling i don't know how to describe it i did like, uh, imagine scuba. you're under the sea you're exploring then as you go lower and lower you suddenly see as because as you go lower and lower you know you have to be close to as object for it to you know become a little bit visible of course yeah it's very gloomy yeah then you suddenly see a huge metal statue of a human face, for example. Now that's gonna freak you out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That will, but it's also uh, it's also very cool. It's like the and the big creatures too is like it's very scary. But actually, it's super rare to see any uh, large creature under under the ocean. So it's also like my dream is to to dive with uh, with a whale at some point. But I'd be I'd be very scared as well. It's the that makes it interesting. Interesting, yeah, like that. That's really scary, but also really interesting. There was this weird clip of this Iranian Iranian guy, fisherman, who on the I think Persian Gulf, they were they saw like a whale that was surfacing, and the guy just casually said, "Put the boat over there. Put the boat over there." And the dude literally just started walking on the whale like it was nothing and just showing off, and <laughs> jumped back on the boat like some crazy okay. guy. <sighs> that is weird. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of whales in that area as well, apparently. Okay. And, well, I think this was a really good episode. 
we've reached cool. the final question and section of the podcast, which is called Time Capsule. And funny enough, one of your posts on our session is named Time Capsules. So those are kind of interesting to me. And all right, so let me explain how it is. Imagine you only had like a couple of minutes, like a, like a short amount of time, right? To say uh, whatever you want. But what I want to ask you actually is what are some of the most important and valuable lessons that you've learned throughout your life thus far that you could summarize them in a couple of sentences? What would they be? And the audience that's going to listen to this, like, you know, part of the episode, it's anyone at any point of time in the future that are listening to this podcast right now. So this answer is from one human, which is yourself, to another human being. So this isn't art-related at all. It's human-related, if that makes sense. Bam, dude. Yeah. No pressure, take right? Your, <laughs> yeah, take your time, man. It's fine. Uh, well, no, I think uh, is, um, meditation is a very useful skill to learn in, in any uh, human life. I think on many levels um, and it's important to follow your fascinations even though they might be very unproductive or weird or anything just follow them until the end because it's kind of what makes you interesting there's um, and also what like for me the things I live for are actually pretty unimportant like the the free diving thing is there's a, a very specific 10 seconds that i live for right now which is like it's not productive it doesn't bring me anything but it's it's important to me and i know that if i didn't have that i'd get depressed so it, it's very important to find out what you'll and it changes during a lifetime so always be like open enough to find your your weird fascinations and never apologize for just following those and i think that's all i have to say in uh, in this uh, time capsule human advice pod all right i guess that's a wrap thank you so much for taking your time and coming on for this episode and thank you to anyone who tuned in and listened to this episode i hope you're enjoying this recent episodes as well and with that being said, we're only like, I think, 16 episodes away. No, sorry. yeah, No, no, sorry. Not 16. 26 episodes away from episode 300. Um, like, it's not certain who it will be or the re- future episodes will be. It's just by chance and luck because I and, like I asked and invited like two, 300 people recently. So it's just um, we'll see who ends up winning the number 300 spots. We'll yeah. see. And with that added away, if you have any comments, suggestions, or critiques, leave them down in the comment section below, as always. And please do make sure to subscribe to the channel. I usually don't. In the past four years, this um, might be their only recent episodes that I've been saying this. I don't want to annoy you guys too much, but I would appreciate that subscribe, right? And if you enjoyed this episode, of course, or any of their episodes. See, I'm not even good at this whole self-promotion <laughs> shit, as you can see, right? Yeah, but it's fun. It, like, it, it's I have watched a bunch. It's a fun podcast. It's a fun cast. Exactly. Watch it, guys. Thank you for having <laughs> me, you. Ramton. It was fun. Yeah, my pleasure. And, of course, if anyone has a question you know, for our guest today, you can email him through his art session or you can message him through our session. The email is in, in, in his art session, which the link is down below in the captions. And with that being said, take care, everyone. Stay safe. Till next episode. Bye-bye. Cheers, guys.